what are the different employee levels? I would imagine 50 is a number because the government here in the United States, there are certain regulations that come into play when you reach a certain headcount. Mm. You have a founder that starts up a company and everybody looks at the founder. And as more employees come in, the communication dissipates. What was important before isn't necessarily important now because the same repercussions aren't happening because people are too busy. What are there different levels of employee size that you see when you go into a company where they run into problems? I'm just throwing out there 50 employees. Could it be as low as 20 employees? What have you seen? I think importantly, it, the the most drastic change happens when you've got one more level of management. So maybe you've got the founder and then the folks who report to the founder and the folks who report to them. That's, that's a, a fairly easy, to, comparatively, an easy kind of culture to manage. As soon as you get one more layer of management, it is a, it, it's it is an explosion of yeah. uh of potential for uh microclimates you know every single manager is going to have a different climate under them and what what worked when you were uh essentially one layer deep or two layers deep right is is not going to work anymore with that one more level um and then th there's a, a little bit less of a concrete way of thinking about it is uh, a company called Smile Software, which uh, now is called Text Expander, hired us when they were about 30 people. And the CEO said to me, I'm hiring you because right now we've got a great culture and we've got a great culture because we've hired really well. And what he said was, that's not scalable. So we need a system so that we can govern, and the, now it's my words, govern, uh, but we can influence culture in a scalable, systematic way. And that's part of why we think of ourselves as engineers, is we can provide a, a structure. It's not, we don't, we, we're not going to create your culture. The culture of the companies that we've worked with all are drastically different. And we've helped them create a certain skeleton, a structure that they can then flesh out with their own idiosyncrasies. That that second layer of management, or as soon as you feel as though, you know, every time we hire somebody, we are bringing in a largely unknown influence. And so conceivably, your next hire, no matter how big or small you are, if you've got three people right now, your next hire could drastically change your culture. And if you've got a thousand people right now, your next hire could drastically change at least the culture of the team that they're hired into. Well, hey folks, I am Aaron Schmuckler, CEO and co-founder at a company called The Yesworks. And I was, I, I don't know when, walking along, minding my own business when somebody clubbed me over the back of the head. And when I came to, here I was, uh, your guest on Sassholes. Welcome to Sassholes. We are revenue ops with an edge. With decades of making interesting decisions, Jamie, Jason, Marcus, and Pete are dedicated to helping aspiring sales leaders accelerate revenues with our no BS approach to sales leadership strategies and tactics. Our show is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. Demandfarm.com. Unlock key account growth with Demand Farm's large deal, key account, and relationship intelligence products. Go to Demandfarm.com now to schedule a demo Ask for Iron Man. Brent Keltner's Winalytics Revenue Acceleration Playbook Masterclass. In five hours over five weeks, help your sales and go-to-market team build the mindset and skills for a new buyer environment. Kick off in product-driven selling versus authentic conversations for all go-to-market teams. Team-level sessions for self-assessment and team dialogue. All go-to-market team wrap-up to identify top go-to-market strategy adjustments. Go to winalytics.com now. We got some shout-outs to do. 
Aaron Zakowski, 10 years at Zamo Digital Marketing. Olivier Baral, new gig, founder, CEO at Vernon. Matt Gaines, how you doing, buddy? One year at Mediafly. Scott Flood, two years at Opportunity. Tyler Lesser, hey man, additional gig co-host and executive producer at the Sales Feed Show. Ellen Huang got promoted to Senior Software Engineer Manager at Google. Way to go, Ellen. You always had game. Justin Michael, additional position, executive coach at Nimchinsky Michael. Jeff Page, three years at DocuSign. Courtney Hanley, how you doing? Look at you. New gig, VP Demand Generation at Amperity. Maria Salter, one year at Exit Coastal Gateway Realty. Phil LaCourt, one year at Ring Central. Leon Dame, one year at Atlas Health. And check out Sarah Longley, got her MBA from Northwestern. Kellogg School of Management. Way to go, Longley. Proud, but not surprised. Hey, we got some happy birthdays. Eric Alvarez and Kevin Drolet. Another spin around the sun. Eric Schmuckler, welcome to the Sassos <laughs> Podcast. You Thank you. Better it's, to a, do, huh? it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. You don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to get clubbed nice. over the head again. Being nice. <laughs> so, Aaron, you're like the culture guru. What the hell is culture? Uh, that's an excellent question. I think there are lots of different ways that it's been defined. The way I think about it is culture, it's the set of contagious behaviors in, in a community. By the way, your company is a community. And also, by the way, every single behavior is contagious. And you know this because you have a company called the Yes Works. That's right. Uh, by by founding this company intended to help businesses build the kind of culture where they want, I I immediately became an expert. So what is Just, a culture engineer then? So we think of what we do as company culture engineering because there are so many interdependent forces at work shaping the behaviors in your company, and they can be hard to understand, hard to see, just like the forces that shape a bridge. And, and here uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where uh, we are based in Tacoma, where there is a bridge called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. There was a bridge called Galloping Gertie, which got that name because in certain windy conditions, the bridge undulated, yeah. and one day it actually undulated itself to pieces. So it's those those hidden resonance frequencies, those hidden forces in your company that can be hard to spot, and we can help you see the matrix so that you are getting all of those forces into harmony and creating the kinds of behaviors, the kinds of uh, the kinds of experience for people where people and profits both thrive. This is where the point at which Pete usually says something like, "All right, all right, you're using way too many big words. I don't understand yeah. what you're talking about." I already about. said it. So undulate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so break that break that down. Like if if I'm you know if I'm a a sales rep somewhere and I'm like I don't know I just got to make calls or I just got to right. close deals I don't care about culture like help help me understand what you mean what variables what forces that kind of thing sure so a ceo calls me up and uh says I've got great people on my front lines and I've got great people managing them they've all got really good work ethics they're kind caring people I don't understand why they're at each other's throats small enough yeah. words so far yeah, okay. pretty good. <laughs> good. Pretty good. Now, yeah. uh, in a couple of minutes of a conversation, I learned that each manager has 15 or so people reporting to them. And then I learned that the that because they are conscientious managers, they are working hard to drive excellent performance. Now, all of the, the working hard to drive excellent performance, I give a big two yeah. thumbs up to because uh, I've got two thumbs, I can do that. Yeah. The 15 <laughs> people, however just is uh, what ca what can't happen in that structure is that the managers don't have time to create really strong relationships of trust with each of those 15 people of the kind that can bear up under the pressure of driving performance you can manage if you're really good about 8 people before the relationship starts to break down under that strain and so there's a hidden force of the quality of those relationships that is breaking down under the strain of excellent management uh, principle of I've got to drive performance. So, Aaron, would it be fair to say that the managers create the culture? 
Uh, I would say that it, it's fair to say that in the same way that the triangles in a bridge create the bridge. It's not the only thing. It has an awful lot of influence that you could talk about the bolts as well. You could talk about the concrete. So the managers are a significantly, uh, they have an awful lot of influence in, in creating the culture. And if you want to drive performance, given that they have anywhere between eight and 15 reports, uh, would it not make sense to get them rather good at helping those people get good at their jobs and become capable instead of driving them into um, stress absolutely and, um, pursuing pointless metrics <laughs> well we, you and i i think in the past marcus have have uh railed against pointless metrics um and yes absolutely the the best mentors the best managers push hard to drive performance they challenge the people that they are working for, that they are that they are working with and they also support those people to meet the challenge and so yeah. you've got to have both the challenge and the support to create a place where people and profits both thrive. And if either one of those things is missing, there's this fantastic, I wish I could take credit for the challenge versus support matrix, but each quadrant in that matrix where you've got high support or and high challenge or low support and high challenge, each, each quadrant has different characteristics. Can you describe the qualities of those quadrants? Absolutely. So, uh, why don't we start uh, where you've got high challenge and low support uh -huh. in that kind of environment, you've got this self-protection uh, fearful culture where people are hoarding information. They've got their own little fiefdoms. Uh, they're, they're likely to cover up what they're doing when somebody else walks by um, and you get people cutting corners and uh, cutting cutting corners ethically as well. So you get your Enron, you get uh, you get Wells Fargo Bank, you know the the kind of multiple accounts that nobody ordered uh, because people are working hard in order to appear productive. Whatever else may happen, uh, and and I'll even go so far as to say I, I wish I could remember what book I read about this. And there's a, a hospital where multiple times something to the effect of uh, a surgeon walking into a, a, an operating room where a patient needs a, uh, a open heart surgery. And this doctor, this surgeon happens to be a uh, an orthopedist who's come in that day to amputate somebody's legs. So they, they come in, they amputate a leg instead of providing open heart surgery. And meanwhile, the nurses look on knowing full well that this is the wrong surgery. And the reason that they do that, is, as Simon Sinek illustrates in his book, Leaders Eat Last, is that they are neurochemically shut down. They are neurochemically prohibited from doing what they know is right. I interviewed a guy called Chris Payton. He was responsible for withdrawing the British troops from Afghanistan in 2012 and had six months to plan it and execute the, uh, the withdrawal. Um, and he had to deal with multiple nationalities, um, you know, the Pentagon, um, you know, uh, Whitehall and everything in between, um, as well as, you know, uh, the Afghans. Um, and um, what he said, I, I asked him a question at the end of um, my podcast interview with him, he said, what was your best mistake? And he came back immediately and he said, um, uh, um, experts uh create paralysis mm. and um he recounted a story and it was heartrending um uh, an injury came in someone had been shot uh, their lung had been um uh, hit and they were trying to scramble a helicopter to recover them um and about a minute later uh, another um location was given that was about 30 miles apart now they weren't going to scramble a helicopter into an unknown zone, uh, not even knowing someone was there. Um, and after the conversation went on for about a minute, he realized or he thought maybe these are two identical injuries, which would be anomalous, but possible. And he didn't say anything. And he's lived with that regret ever since. Um, and you have to condition people uh, to challenge authority and challenge expertise. And so where you have that high challenge, uh, low support environment, 
Um, is the challenge coming from below or above when you're this generally is coming from above, right? Uh, this okay. is the, we expect you to reach this bar. You've got to open this many accounts. You've got to deliver this much profitability. Those are the, those are the job requirements. Um, you know, you can think about Jack Welsh's, uh, stack and yank or, or rank and yank. Okay. So we've got, what about, um, low challenge, high support, low challenge, high support. You get uh, an environment of complacency. You get this is how we've always done things. Uh, you can think about, for example, Kodak, where uh, you know they they invented digital photography. And when I lived in Rochester, New York, they owned half the town. I mean, it was a Kodak city. Yeah, and they invented digital photography. They thought we're a paper and chemical processing company. Digital photography requires none of those things, so we're going to put it on a shelf, and if somebody else wants to use it, then we will license it to them. And as we all know, what was the when was the last time you took film in to get processed? Well, Kodak is all but out of business now because they were permitted to be complacent. I worked in two separate businesses that were all probably considered startups. And one of them was low challenge, high support. And one of them was high challenge, low support. Mm. And yeah. it is, and you know, I mean, I, I, I do appreciate a good extreme example with surgeons and stuff, but what, what nobody's going to die with what we're doing, but it is probably as difficult to live through that experience where you say, Stomach gosh, out. just because you've done this stuff before, doesn't mean it's a bad idea or we have to figure out why it didn't work. Like, I mean, there's just so much or this maniacal focus on a number when you're basically entering into the unknown. I mean, a very mm -hmm. simple example, and, and it's, it's probably a bad example because a million holes get poked into it. But this is what people do with events all the time. They're like, yeah, we got to go to this event. And then you go and then there aren't any leads and then we're not going to go. And it's like, wait, what? what's the point? What are we trying to accomplish? And you get in this like vicious cycle of, challenge support where it's low and high and low and high and there's mm -hmm. like off cycles it's very stressful and weird for people and it does it does push the culture down to people go well i i guess i'll just wait till my boss tells me what to do this too will pass uh, kind of environments as well uh, right. because people are reacting to the headline of the moment uh, i interviewed a guy called mark swakey uh, um, and he was getting a call from his ceo two three four times a week uh, about the numbers, the metrics. Uh, and then he was getting um, direction from the board um, uh, telling him to change direction midweek. I mean, how the hell do you run an environment like that, uh, in an environment like that? There's something that Jason said uh, sparked, a, uh, I think, a very important thought. <laughs> Every once in a while, I have yes. one of those. Uh, Glad you I know, could help. Jason, you were talking about kind of going back and forth, that cycle between challenge yep. and support, challenge and support. And what I find often talking to business leaders is that they are they are working so hard to strike the right balance between challenge and support as if it is a balancing act because that's what they've come to understand that's what they've been taught. I do not I think that is a a, a fool's errand to try to balance yeah. challenge against support. What you've really got to do is marry them and turn yeah, them yeah. both up consistently. I love you. Perform you're an engineer okay so you help build things whether it's triangles or <laughs> angulate whatever that word was Ooh, but that's a tough one Pete. From, undulate from start i'm looking up angulate right now <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that word either <laughs> we'll put it right here uh when do you bring in an hr leader then because the only people i hate worse in marketing is hr when they come <laughs> in what happens to like how many people are there to have somebody in charge of HR? And when mm. they come in, they screw everything up, Aaron. Can you clean that up for me? Well, uh, and I guess before you answer that, is is the human resources team even responsible for administering culture in some way? That is an excellent question, uh, Jason. And I, I prefer your question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna answer yours. <laughs> uh <laughs> no, <laughs> the answer that's is no. Pete, that's why Pete hates marketing people. <laughs> they're, they're not. They're not in charge of culture. Uh, th they can screw it up. They can screw yep. it up. They cannot make it. They cannot 
fix it. Um, and ways that they can screw it up include creating an HR, uh, a, an employee handbook that is really thick, right? Mary Barra came in to, uh, to be the CEO of, uh, of GM and she took their 14 page dress code and she shortened, shortened it to two words, dress appropriately. And that, that does two things. One, it really simplifies things. Yep. It, it, it tells people you are a human being with judgment and we trust your judgment where the 14 page uh, dress code said, you do not have permission to use your judgment here. We do not trust your judgment. And so that kind of meta message, that message under the message is hugely impactful. And what she also did was she created the necessity for conversations between managers and their employees, which is awesome. We want conversations. Conversations build trust. Conversations build relationships. And if you are creating policy to, uh, to, to prevent the need for those conversations, then you are destroying your culture one policy at a time. Okay. So if you've, uh, sorry, Jason, you looked like you had a question there. No, I'm I'm writing down conversations build trust because I'm I've got to, I'm going to say that to somebody specific today. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to quote? Are you going to quote Aaron? Are you Aaron gonna... said? Okay. No, I'm going to slack it to him. <laughs> so Aaron, Aaron and, and Marcus, all these fancy words. I haven't heard anything about values or mission statements or any of that crap that people sl- throw up on the on the walls and don't follow through on do, but the, do yeah but n- none of that stuff is real anyway it's just masturbatory it, it's a way of you know giving themselves a stroke and telling themselves that they're actually doing something about culture uh, and they're paying lip service to it because culture is visceral it, it's it's everything that you do it's everything you know it's it's the way uh it's the way we do things around here yeah it's the way we think um, and if we think in a blinkered way um, you know, our culture is going to limit us. Um, so our- if you take your values, for example, if if you look at, okay, what do we do around here? And use that as a mechanism for articulating your values. Fantastic. If you put your values on the wall and then uh, ignore them, not so fantastic. Uh, another leader reached out to me and said, I don't understand why my people don't uh, don't go above and beyond ever. You know, but, you know, I, I, I say, Hey, there's, we need somebody to stay late and do X today. And nobody ever volunteers, even though above and beyond is one of our values. And so I had conversations with people who were, who, who worked in this company. And I said, so what about this value of above and beyond? How do you see that reflected in your company? And they said, we straight up don't. Every time I reach up to my manager and I say, here's something that I want to do for this customer. I know it's it's outside of the scope and you know we've been late on this or whatever we you know there there are reasons that I think we should go above and beyond for this customer. I'm told no. And so they're in an environment where they are never they never experience the rewards of being permitted to go above and beyond for the customer. So they have no uh gut, you know that Marcus you called it visceral is yeah. that we are viscerally affected when we're prevented for, from going above and beyond. And we just don't feel like it. It's not well, that they are saying, I won't go above and beyond for the company. They just don't feel like it. They don't know this, what it means either. I mean, what but, does above this, and beyond mean? But uh, th- this goes much deeper. Uh, if two or more uh, fundamental human values like significance, mm-hmm. certainty, novelty, belonging, are threatened, then people will override their values in the blink of an eye. Yes. Um, and so the the leadership um, is breaking the Jimmy Carr rule, which is if you meet three assholes by 12 o'clock, you're the asshole. <laughs> so Thanks. in all probability, he, he said it slightly differently, uh, which is the more anglicized version, but I can't say that on American press. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's press now, but it's press. We'll put the card right here. Yeah, you already said it on this podcast, and we put every word of it on it. 
You are now press. Congratulations. I know. I had a pass and go backstage, whatever. It it just baffles me um, that we seem to spend so much time beating our head against the wall, uh, trying to convince idiots uh, to be decent human beings. Because that's ultimately, I mean, none of this is fucking rocket science. I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, this uh, this last week, um, a client of mine had responded to a problem that he'd had. We talked about it, uh, and he'd applied the principle of being a decent human being in an account. And he won a 10-year deal, and they paid five years in advance, okay, with inflation built in. And it was all because he actually paid attention to the other human being. And the CFO was reluctant and he spotted it because we identified uh, what uh, the likely issue was. And he went into that. And then they discovered that five years previously, they'd made another purchase decision like this. And they were afraid of making the same mistake that cost them four million quid. Yeah. And he would never have known that if he'd carried on trying to peddle shit. Um, and we've got to humanize this whole process of being salespeople, marketers, managers, and leaders. And so I really want to understand what high challenge, high support looks like in terms of creating an alignment across the business with the customer at the heart. Right. Well, sh- should we get into low challenge, low support before we do that? Yeah, go on then. Or, or should we go straight to the good right, stuff? You take over. Fuck it. All right. So, so the low <laughs> challenge, low support. Um, is uh, is Sears. Uh, and Marcus, uh, in case you're not familiar with Sears, it is, sure. this, uh, it is this department store with tools and clothes and uh, all kinds of all kinds of things that uh, long before they really started to shut down, walking in there was like walking into a ghost town. You couldn't find anybody. The shelves were not stocked. It just felt miserable. And I call this we, the we depressive dead Fraser. zone. We have House of Fraser. For that. <laughs> you, you walk in there and there's lino- linoleum floors that are lifting and uh, people oh, yeah. assaulting you with perfume. And just nobody gives a shit, right? Nobody gives a shit in these environments. Why challenge myself? I'm not going to be acknowledged for it. Why challenge myself? Nobody's asking me to. Nobody is supporting me to do anything. I don't have the tools that I need. So Screw it. So you get Sears, you get your Department of Motor Vehicles, you get all of your government, most of your government agencies. Um, uh, and so let's talk, let, enough of that. Let, that's a, a pain in the ass. Let's well, talk about Eddie, high support. Aaron, you brought up Sears. Let's talk Eddie Lampert. Financial guy just bought everything to liquidate everything, held all his meetings in the Northeast and before COVID was managing by video screen. What does that do to the culture? Marcus talked about the the human appetite, the 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 need for significance. And for the vast majority of us, money is not the same as significance. It often reflects significance, but it it is it is no more significance itself than my reflection in a mirror is me. Money may reflect significance. Significance is about impact. What am I going to do with that money? What is the value of my work? How do people uh, respond to what we're doing? How do people respond to what we're selling? I used to be a, a, a waiter and I I liked my job more in a job where I made lower tips because I was doing lower volume because I liked the food and it was just a pleasure to tell people you're going to like this. Whereas, you know, uh, someplace else I was saying, hey, a lot of people like it. <laughs> right? and I just couldn't get behind it because, but I was having an impact selling people food that I knew was just going to be a pleasure. But th- this is again, if, if he wants to get people to give more, create meaningful work. Right. Create the conditions where people find meaning and have a reason to give a, um, discretionary effort. Uh, you and can't if, demand it. it. It's not a right. Yeah. The same thing with go, le, with bringing people back to work. If you want people to come back to the office, make that worthwhile. Not because like certain billionaires we might talk about, you've mandated it and you've told people come in or get out, but because you make coming to work 
intrinsically rewarding and desirable. Aaron, when you when you go into a company, what is the first thing? What are the what is the thing that pops up the most that is fucked up that you go in and correct? What are you mm. fixing right away? Uh, I know all companies are different. Okay, put that yeah. to the side. But what do you what are you going in and fixing right away? As you might imagine, it it often all starts at the top, and so uh, the companies that I most enjoy working with are the ones where the leader of the company says either what am I do- doing wrong or what can I be doing better? How do we improve things? The ones that I really don't like working with because it feels like an uphill battle and because we can't be as effective are the places where the leader says, I'd like you to come in and fix my people. I was referred to a CEO who asked me to, I was referred to the CEO for coaching for her COO whose behavior she didn't appreciate. I don't, I'm, I'm not digging the, the behavior from this person. Well, I said, great, let's talk about it. We dig into what are the behaviors that you don't like, and then we dig into what is the environment that he's in. And I don't just mean, you know, what are how big is the room and uh, is it warm enough and does he have the tools that he needs, although those things are also important. It's also, you know, what is the the cultural environment? How are people behaving around him? How are people communicating around him? What have you told him about these behaviors? How are uh, in the in the words of uh, Jerry Colonna, how are you complicit? How are you contributing to the behaviors you don't want to see? And to her credit, we've shifted from COO needs coaching to our culture needs remediation. Our culture needs some change. Let's focus there and see what impact that has on his behavior. If you're going to change a culture, Aaron... There has to be differentiation. What's a good employee? What's a bad employee? Okay, this is revenue operations. Mm-hmm. It's either there's revenue or there's not. Okay, and somebody needs to know that they're not doing a, a, a good job. And I think that's where communication comes in. Some companies don't even do one on ones anymore. They don't even do annual reviews. If how do you give that feedback if you're not formally meeting to a meeting with an employee that says, "Hey, this is serious. This is." what I like, this is what I don't like. How do you correct that in a company or do you see that? Uh, I do see that a lot. And I, and um, boy, there's a lot, there's a lot for me to respond to there. So I'll start by pushing back on the idea that there is such a thing as a good employer and, and a bad employee and just say, not because it's not true, but because it's not, it's not a useful way to think about it. It, it creates conflict that is not constructive. And I'm a big fan of conflict. So I think there's an effective employee for this job and there's an ineffective employee for this job. So you've got to be effective. And effective includes contributing to the culture, contributing to the team that we're trying to build. So you're either effective or you're ineffective. And ineffective can also include just actively destructive. There's, are you effective? And then comes the feedback. Yes, you're effective. No, you're not. And and I, I I've done a whole podcast and and do a a workshop with with people on what does accountability actually mean. One of the one of the reasons we have conflict around accountability conversations is I'm saying accountability and you're saying accountability, but we're not talking about the same concept. So it's got four pieces. Um, one of them is reliability. Do you do what you say you're going to do? So. Effective feedback requires incredible specificity. You said you were going to make 30 calls yesterday. You made 20. That's two thirds. Let's talk about why. You're intended to close two meetings with those 30 calls. You closed four. That's incredibly effective. Maybe we don't want you making 30 calls. Maybe 20 calls or even 10 might be better. If, if you can close five with 10 calls, then shit, <laughs> do that. Um, and, and your mavericks are the people who are effective without being reliable. They don't do what they say they're going to do necessarily, or they don't meet the expectations in terms of what are the, the metrics of behavior, but they meet the, the expectations in terms of the, of the uh, metrics of effectiveness. Well, then if you want to have a sound culture, you've got to change the expectations so that you're meeting that maverick where they live. 
um, instead of having a rule breaker. You just change the rules. You're talking about the outliers, but how do you give feedback to the rest of the company? Differentiation, Jack Welch, 2070-10, okay, yeah. drop the 10%. But if you're going to change a company, you have to change the 70%. Do you have a formal way of communicating where, where the, the leader and the subordinate get together? or the I, leader t- follow? I talk about the bicycle principle. Now, the, riding a bicycle is an incredibly sophisticated operation. Right. If you think about what it would take to create a robot that can ride a bicycle, I mean, that's that's going to be hard. And the reason that I learned to ride a bicycle in a single morning is that the bicycle gives me incredibly frequent, timely, accurate and unemotional feedback. Hundreds of pieces of feedback per second. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So. In order to be if giving effective feedback to drive performance and provide support, you've got to be giving feedback as often as you can, as accurately as you can, as unemotionally as you can, and as timely as you can. So uh, giving feedback all the time is excellent. And to your to your question about creating, A, there's a formal structure that, that we at the S-Works recommend for giving that feedback so that it's most likely to be well-received and implemented. And then also we recommend more structured environments like the weekly one-on-one. You got to be doing a weekly one-on-one if you want to build a strong relationship that can keep people around, keep people fulfilled. I don't know that people need to be happy at work. They sure as heck need to be fulfilled. To your point about annual reviews, I don't recommend them because they're so infrequent and they cost so much work that they are kind of a waste. That said, a monthly or quarterly uh, cadence of, Pete, here's how you are doing in general against my expectations. You're meeting my expectations. You're exceeding my expectations in this way, or you're falling short of my expectations by this much and in this way with specificity. That's an incredibly important conversation to be having on a regular. I want you to finish this one up, Aaron, because these reviews, let's talk pay at risk, okay? The reviews are somehow tied to employees, whether you're in sales or not sales, how well you do to get this bonus. And if you're not, if there isn't a good process in place, the bonus turns into, well, do I like them or not? I'll give them a really good bonus. I've seen that screw up culture in a, in a bunch of companies. How does that come into play, pay at risk, feedback, and culture? This is a very complicated question, and I don't know that I have the greatest answer. Not everybody is motivated by money. Almost everybody is motivated by relationship. So if you don't mind, I'm going to I'm going to politician my way around, (laughs) except that I'm I'm naming it. I'm going to politician my way around your question about bonuses (laughs) and say, Put your focus on more powerful and more universal motivators. Like, how is our relationship? When I've had a boss who is really good and really provides me with great challenge and great support, and I learn that I am disappointing my boss, fuck. Yeah, it's powerful. It's not scalable. But so, but also, I it think is that scalable. some people don't care if they're disappointing their boss. I mean, I... I care. You, you, you care, Aaron. But I think we've all known people who don't care whether that's a thing. But, but I think we're asking the wrong question, and the right the the wrong question is about all of this stuff. The right question is, um, what is the job we are all trying to get done, and why are we not all working towards that? Um, because um, mm-hmm. if you look at the way most cultures are set up. Um, they're set up to serve the interests of a tiny handful, uh, the shareholders or the founder or whoever, um, and fuck the rest. Um, and th- th- whilst I- I'm no socialist, but what I can say with the hand on heart is I know for a fact there is not a single employee who has ever come to work excited at the prospect of making their already wealthy shareholders richer. 
Okay, so we've got to do away with this fabricated myth um, that somehow uh, we all serve shareholder value. Um, shareholder value is the last thing on almost everybody's mind, unless you've got uh, some piece of equity or uh, some options. And let's face it, most of the people who've taken options in startups uh, have actually been working for free and then ended up with fuck all. OK, so you know, the, the, the myth of the unicorn um, is maybe the two to three percent and only 15 percent survive. So what we really want to do is look at better examples. And I would look at um, companies like 37 Signals that have for the last 21 years been focused exclusively on trying to create great product and a profitable business. And with hundreds of thousands of customers paying them 50 bucks a pop, they've only got 80 headcount. Um, they don't talk about politics. They have a very flat structure. They've never worked in the same place because they have a distributed uh, organization and they were born in the technology space. So they are perfectly happy working remotely. I have this beef uh, with a lot of old school dinosaurs like Pete uh, and other people, my generation, um, <laughs> who think that you have to be in the office. You don't. You just have to be a better fucking manager. And to build on this, managers need to be spending 80% of their time with their troops, not twatting around on spreadsheets and producing pointless fucking reports. That's not their job. My, they have two my, functions in life. Hire the best people and create the conditions for those people to thrive. Hold on. Marcus, Aaron, you're talking on both sides of your mouth. Compensation plans are in place to drive behavior. Okay. You, you have a bonus the wrong place behavior. Drive, Then why do we do it? Pay everybody's salary. Okay. Very good question. So so let's – so I'm, you, you, I'm, I've got to earn a living, right? So So my salary doesn't drive my behavior. My salary permits my behavior. That's that's me, and I acknowledge that I'm that I'm not universally that way. And I encourage you, Pete, to go and check out uh, Dan Pink. Uh, Dan Pink and Alfie Cohn, right? Uh, talks about what happens when you incentivize behavior, and it, it, he he shows uh, this incredible example where you give two teams uh, a box of thumbtacks little cardboard box of thumbtacks and a candle uh, on the table and a box of matches. And you say, okay, your job is as quickly as you can to get this box, uh, excuse me, to get this candle attached to the wall so that no wax uh, can drip on the table. And people start trying to thumbtack the candle to the wall. And if you incentivize this team, you say there's a hundred bucks in it for each of you. And you don't incentivize this team. You just say, do it as fast as you can. Which team do you think gets the job done faster? The team without an incentive. Just do it as fast as you can, yeah. The minute because you turn play into work, you fuck it up. They don't work as hard, perhaps, but they work more thoughtfully. Their brains are still alive. This team shuts off their brains because of that hundred bucks and they work their ass off to get that thing attached to the wall and they can't figure it out because what they can't do is see that box of thumbtacks as anything but a box of thumbtacks. The other team very quickly dumps out the thumbtacks and thumbtacks the box to the wall and puts the candle in the box. You're smarter when you're not, when, when uh, that kind of extrinsic motivation is not a part of the picture. So sales so, and non-sales all get paid the salary. Y yes, possibly. Pot potentially. Re read Alfie Cohn's book, Punished by Rewards. Uh, fascinating chap. Um, he did a, a meta study on um, hundreds and hundreds of comp plans um, and uh, various schemes. Um, and the moment you in incentivize people or attempt to incentivize people with money, and you turn something that is intellectually challenging, meaningful, and fun, you turn it into work, and then the standards drop. Um, people become mercenary. Um, it's the same thing with kids uh, in education. Give, um, give kids uh, recognition for trying hard. And I know we're going to get a lot of pushback. It's all fucking woke. It's not. When you recognize kids for trying hard, even when they fail, 
they continue to want to work on difficult problems. <laughs> if you recognize them uh, for uh, being intelligent, then they stop working hard and they go for the easy problems because they're looking for the significance. They, in fact, become more brittle because they they don't want yeah. to disprove the idea that they're intelligent. Yeah. Hey, I want to direct some traffic here a little bit because I Marcus has asked multiple times, Aaron, and I can tell he's getting all <laughs> frustrated by tell me what high challenge, high okay. support looks like. And we're talking about it. But before you do that, I was I had this thought in my head that when you because i think that's a great way to end right high challenge high support this is what it looks like you're going to leave everybody with asking a thousand questions and then they're going to want you know meet you and pay you money um but when you go when you go into a company i'm guessing a big enough company that you're not looking you don't find that the whole company applies to one quadrant that you have some groups that are low challenge, low support, and some groups that are, you know, low challenge, high support, so, like groups that are all over this quadrant. Yeah. So what's interesting to me is like, let's talk about the high, high, but how do you then apply, like when you lay that template over the company and you look at all these different groups, I think what you would want to try to do maybe is unify them in some way. That's got to be really tough because now you're unifying like lots of different behaviors. You're trying to figure out a lot of different behaviors. So, so uh, here's, yes, Marcus, here's what companies do don't do, line. right? And this is both a, both challenge and support. Companies do not have a system for managing people. They don't, you can't go into most companies and say, this is how we manage people around here. This is the process you follow. And for, for whatever reason, right? We call things like this, so management is a soft skill. Bullshit. There is science. You can break it down. If you do this, then you get that. Not universally, just like sometimes my computer crashes, but yeah. pretty close. <laughs> it yeah. is there. There is garbage in, garbage out in management, just like there is in computing. So, so to your point of uh, like, how do we how do we uh, level out the performance across our teams? You have to have a system of management. And that's, uh, in some ways, answers your question, Pete, too, is one of the first things that we do in the companies that we work with is we say, okay, how do you manage people around here? And if they don't have a universal answer, here are the tools that we use, here is the cadence that we use them in, then you know you've got a problem. So it is supportive to a manager to say, this is the toolkit. This is the cadence. This is the order of operations for how we manage people around here. And you are going to use your personality. Just like when you hear one violinist play a, a tune, it's going to sound different from somebody else, even though they're using the same sheet music, because we have different expression within very tight constraints. I'm not saying that the system of management has to be tight, but it does have to be constrained. There are edges, there are boundaries, there is a cadence and there is a system. So it's supportive to give them that system, just like it's supportive to give somebody who has a long distance to travel a car. And it is also challenging to say, this is the standard, however much it might rub you the wrong way, or however much, however difficult it may be for you to do this, you've got to meet the standard. That's a challenge. Aaron, we're getting towards the end of the show. And maybe I, I like this. Maybe we could sum it up this way. Pay at risk for anybody at a company means that success is optional. Would you agree with that? Pay at risk. If you don't not do having not hurt, having my pay at risk means that I don't have to succeed. Is that is that what you're suggesting? It means that you, your OTE is a uh, hundred grand a year, seventy grand is salary, thirty grand comes from a bonus. Uh huh. And what you're saying is, well. <laughs> You're only. I'm only getting seventy percent success. Should should everybody in the entire company get paid a flat salary? I d I don't know. Okay. And pay should be at risk. Pay should be at risk. Now, do we make it as a team? That might be a way of assessing a bonus, rather than do you make it? Because one of the things that is overlooked that in business that's not overlooked in basketball is the assist. 
there are people out there who do not perform according to the matrix that are measured in most companies. That doesn't mean that there aren't five people around them who are performing better for their being there than they would without that person there. So we've got to find ways of, of measuring that kind of catalytic effect. And pay is at risk in that your job is not guaranteed. If you aren't meeting the standards of your job, you are not going to keep your job. Well, I'd like to interject here because there's a really important point, which is that the separation of the different functions, certainly across the entire revenue operation, has uh, created a massive disconnect. The customers, this forgotten afterthought, employees <laughs> are um, utilities uh, to be exploited. Um, 60% of sales managers, uh, I heard a report um, last week, 60% of sales managers today are suffering from a stress-related medical condition. Mm. Um, and that's insane. I mean, these people are um, managing and re you know, responsible for between eight and 15 people uh, who are on payroll. And each of those is on what, 20, 30, 50, 80, 150, 300 grand. And you're going to put the person in charge under that much pressure. Are you fucking insane? So we've got to start by re rethinking um, about how these organizations work together. We need to seat people uh, next to one another so that they see the effects of uh, the work that they do. Oh, so, marketing, so important. FDRs, AECSs, product management, finance, legal, operations, they all need to be engaged with one another. They need to meet regularly. And um, you know, the managers uh, of those departments need to be engaging and working on, right, what are we trying to accomplish? How do we all work towards that purpose? So important. That, uh, in, his, in his there. book, Give and Take, Adam Grant uh, gives a, a case study of these uh, folks who were involved in, in giving um, scholarships. And these folks are overworked and burnt out, just completely exhausted. And they, uh, as an experiment, they they give these folks letters from the recipients of the scholarships that just express thanks and and tell a little bit of story about what that uh, what that scholarship has permitted for for them, and burnout dropped precipitously just as a result of having been able to experience at that level, the impact of their work. Now you take folks at that new level of burnout and instead of bringing them the letter, you actually allow them to meet the folks who are receiving these scholarships. And again, the levels of, of burnout precipitate already from that significantly lower level. The connection to the impact of our work is so incredibly important. And for, for an example from my work, we had an architecture firm hire us uh, and they said, we've got these new architects who come in and it's a revolving door. We cannot keep them. And I learned that some of these uh, entry level architects had been involved in creating this beautiful building, a 25 minutes drive from the firm. And uh, it was being used. Everybody was really happy in that, in that building. And I've been in that building. It's lovely. I would love to work in that building. And these entry-level architects had never even been to see the building that they had a hand in creating. That is a significant contributor to their revolving door. Aaron Schmuckler, way to find your way to the SAS Holes podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you clubbed me over the head. What, exactly. What is the name yeah. of your podcast? The Yes Works? What's it called? Uh, my podcast has been sleeping and we are going to uh, revive it. It's called Mighty Good Work and it's dedicated to leaders who believe that uh, that what's good for business can also be good for people. We should have an absolutely fantastic life at work so that we can deliver absolutely fantastic results. I'll put for a card right here. What's it called again? Mighty Good Work. Mighty Good Works. And yeah. all the business leaders that are watching and listening, they say, you know what? I say yes to Aaron Schmuckler. How can they get a hold of you? 
I am the only Aaron Schmuckler on LinkedIn. So that's that's a very easy way to reach nice. me. And another easy way to reach me is to find me at the yesworks.com. Absolutely. Cool. Great show. Great show, Aaron. Thank you. Well, thank Thanks, you, fellas, for, uh, Thanks, for the abduction. <laughs> it's been <laughs> really uh, nice, despite my headache. To, yeah, the uh, headache goes this away. Conversation. Yeah, oh, yeah, when we get going. <laughs> well, culture is a fucking headache. <laughs> <laughs> Our show is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. Demandfarm.com. Unlock key account growth with Demand Farm's large deal, key account, and relationship intelligence products. Go to demandfarm.com now to schedule a demo. Ask for Iron Man. Brent Keltner's Winalytics Revenue Acceleration Playbook Masterclass. In five hours over five weeks, help your sales and go-to-market team build the mindset and skills for a new buyer environment. Kick off in product driven selling versus authentic conversations for all go to market teams. Team level sessions for self assessment and team dialogue. All go to market team wrap up to identify top go to market strategy adjustments. Go to winalytics.com now.